you very much. And let me just uh, point out that this is a co-authored paper, um, both um, by me and uh, <coughs> primarily by Mark Lysett, who is sitting quietly in the front row there as my, my silent partner uh, in this. We want to, um, as, as archaeologists with a long um, history of working in India, address really the subtitle of the conference, um, and that is uh, Protecting India's Cultural Heritage. So to be, to be priceless is not to be invaluable, right? So we want to make the point today that the past not only has value, but that it has values as plural. And the past also has meanings, it's plural as well. And here in South Asia, as in many other places, of course, the past finally also has histories um, within which disparate regimes of value and meaning have operated. Now, often this is a particularly rich history, as in symbols of the politics of heritage, of sovereignty, authority, and authenticity. But we also make the point that equally important are the many smaller histories <laughs> of the everyday. Yeah, many smaller histories of the every, everyday, we say many, which are instantiated only in material form. So whether um, in the form of the Udaya Giri Balakrishna, which we could talk about, the Taj Mahal, the Ashokan Wheel, or we say the remnants of a long abandoned village, the past as it's conceived, acted on, and understood is, we would say, saturated with potential meanings, with valences, and forms of value that resist simple categorization or reduction to a, a standard medium. So while the nuances of social memory, as we discussed here, may seem uh, rather remote from the um, everyday business of cultural resource management, as we would say in the US, or the co topic of this conference, we want to suggest, actually, that this complex richness is not secondary or beside the point for evaluating heritage protection, but rather that it's at the heart of understanding the scope of that task. And so here we turn just for a moment to E.P. Thompson's concept of moral economy to help explain how meaning and value um, are intertwined. And this, as many of you know, was a, a notion developed um, as a framework for understanding social legitimation and collective action in 18th century England. Um, and the idea of moral economy has been elaborated and generalized most famously by James Scott as a useful heuristic for examining the socially embedded practices, the understandings, and the obligations that attend to transaction and circulation in different regimes of value. So simply put then, and I'll put it up on the slide here too, um, the social value of the past, we would say, is irre irreducible to a universal currency, right? Because it's crucially dependent on cultural and political settings that make some kinds of symbols, objects, or places effective markers for and claims to history, heritage, or sovereignty at a particular moment and for a particular audience. This is a point that's been made already by several people in this conference, okay? So the, these past social and cultural settings, as we put it here though, um, and this is our point, are recoverable only through the analysis of context, which is uh, the lifeblood of archeological reasoning. So paraphrasing here, probably every introductory textbook in archeology span and quoting directly from the uh, Society for American Archeology span website, context, they say, in archaeology refers to the relationship that artifacts have to each other and to the situation in which they're found. When people remove an artifact without recording its precise location, the context is lost forever, and the artifact has little to no scientific value. Context is what allows archaeologists to understand the relationship between artifacts on the same site, as well as how different archaeological sites are related to each other, one another. So archaeological context then is re both relational and comprehensive. Right? It refers to a totality of spatial relations of items um, in a sedimentary deposit, right? including objects of human uh, manufacture, of human alteration and accumulation, as well as things like the natural um, constituents of the soil. What we mean by context is not the same as what we mean by provenance. It's not simply an attribute of objects, right? And it's this documentation of context that makes archaeology, we'll say, so, so interesting uh, to some of us anyway, to, so valuable and, of course, so very, very, very tedious. So given then, you're supposed to laugh at that point, but that's okay, right? So, so given then a, an empirical base uh, defined by context, 
a relational field requiring intense documentation and analysis and made up of constituents that say that are of little to no value outside that spatial field of relations. Archaeology, and of course a significant component of cultural heritage, is particularly vulnerable to any force that devalues context. And in this example, in this slide, we might say that the house on the left, this Iron Age house, is virtually all context. Right? If the context is removed, there's really, in some sense, no more house. The house is inferred from the um, contextual relationships of um, stone, ash, rock, and so on. The portable iron blade <coughs> found on the floor of the house um, has perhaps a greater potential for decontextualization. You can pick it up and carry it away in a way you can't um, carry away the house. Um, but here, too, there's a significant loss in this kind of decontextualization. So to say, as we have, that the past has a moral economy, then, is to recognize the social networks in which objects, symbols, and meanings associated with archaeological and ritual objects circulate both in their own time um, and as part of ongoing and really never completed history of material culture. And the term, I think, material culture is critical, crucial here precisely because the meaningful past, we say, is made manifest by its very materiality, right? By the objects, the places, and the symbols that we encounter, interpret, and manipulate as we incorporate history into the present. So, and if the, if the material nature of those markers of the past is a particularly effective way of indexing social memory, um, it also then creates new tensions and vulnerabilities as the moral economies of the past intersect with very different regimes of value, which is what we're talking about here. So in particular, where archaeological or, or, partic or ritual objects are subsumed within commodity forms, their value is subject to an entirely different and frequently incompatible calculus. Right? It's here that the priceless attains a price, that circulation in the occurs in the form of true markets, and that other values and other meanings quickly become secondary. So, of course, what makes some antiquities valuable commodities typically renders others as without value, perhaps at best irrelevant to the market. Allied to, but not exactly the same as, the universalizing sense of value inherent in the commodity is the artistic or aesthetic value of objects as art objects. While this is, while this is a form of universal, and we say kind of quasi-universal valuation, that might make an antiquity particularly vulnerable to commodification, it might also contribute to its protection, to its conservation. So while the moral economy of the past, as it's represented in material culture, is intersected both by commodity value and by aesthetic value, we would make the point but that's fully specified by neither one. So similarly, sacred images, as we've heard in several papers already, play a very different role in devotional context than they do as art objects. And these are a couple of images from our field work, um, which are um, older, obviously, as you can see from the captions, but are very much in active, uh, active devotional use out on the landscape. So, but together then, these indices and intersections, these different meanings, act to devalue context in two very important ways. First are the social contexts in which moral economies operate and are understood. And second, the archaeological or research context in, uh, on which much of our knowledge of the past is based. So loss of context in either sense is irretrievable. Right? Context is itself generally resistant to commodification and therefore without any kind of true market value. That is, context, you might say, is priceless, it's fragile, and absolutely threatened by universalizing regimes of value. So clearly then the past, its cultural meaning, and its scientific value are in danger wherever archaeological, ritual, or cultural contexts are under threat. Just as clearly, though, and we want to make the point here, I think, very strongly, that commodification of material indices of the past is one key element of that threat, but so also are other processes which are tied to the commodification, that those forms of commodification and expansion. And here we would point to urbanization, agricultural intensification, mining, quarrying, and other forms of resource extraction. 
And in our experience uh, over the last 30 years of intensive and sustained archaeological research in southern India, um, it's clear that these processes in particular pose a significant, and I would say very significantly accelerated threat to India's cultural heritage. Of the thousands of archaeological sites that we've documented, I'll just show you some maps, but just promise we have documented thousands of archaeological sites. Hundreds have been completely destroyed, and many more are damaged uh, almost beyond recognition. So these losses, we want to point out, have affected sites from all time periods, from sites of the southern Neolithic, with its important record of early farming, including the local domestication of several grains and even of zebu cattle. Here's a very curious and interesting feature we find only in southern India, um, an ash mound, Neolithic ash mound made of fired cattle dung, very old. Uh, many of these ash mounds are uh, being destroyed. Um, two, the dramatic megaliths of the South Indian Iron Age. Megaliths, which we would say, argue are just as spectacular, but not nearly as well known. Um, as of those of the, of the UK and of Europe, this is the site of Harabenikal, and here's a variety of different South Indian uh, megalithic forms that we've documented. And I'm just going to show you this one um, outcrop. It's a granitic outcrop surrounded by rice paddies, as you can see here. We've documented in the late 90s a major megalithic complex. Uh, with more than 500 megaliths, including some forms that you don't find anywhere else, uh, as far as we know, in, in uh, South Asia, and we only get those here, um, in which uh, granite quar illegal quarrying has, uh, at the time of this photo in 2008, already exposed on the left-hand side then the entire settlement area. The rest is just this large mortuary complex. And you can see quarrying has started at the base of the complex uh, where there's a, just um, bare rock exposed. And um, that's 2008. Um, we documented it in the late 1990s. By 2014, when we returned, there's absolutely nothing left of this entire megalithic complex. So it's, the quarrying is a huge part of it. But of course, megaliths, as you can see, are basically just these nice stone slabs already quarried out for you. So the megaliths themselves were also carted away as kind of pre-quarried stone. Um, uh, other sites of other time periods, of course, are also vulnerable, as we've seen. Um, and that includes things like the temples, the mosques, and the other buildings of the more recent past. Here's a, a, just a, a news story from the Global Heritage Fund about illegal quarrying leading to the collapse of a temple at uh, Hampi, Vijinagra. Um, which is a sort of more obvious uh, uh, problem, but this is all in this, in this same area. This is a part of our study area. So illegal quarrying uh, is rampant and causing all kinds of problems. Uh, we also see things like this. Um, this is a relatively uh, recent example. This just, came, just happened um, in 2013. In the village of Kumlapur, there's a, a structure, 153-year-old structure, so not associated with the Vijayanagara Empire, but it's right on the road. And Kumlapur is a monument protected by state archaeology department, um, but was basically bulldozed uh, and flattened by the public works department in the expansion of a road. Okay. So just as scholars um, are beginning to understand this very impressive historical record of southern India from the Neolithic all the way up until the present, um, it's being destroyed, we might say, without a backward glance. So these are important and absolute losses, records of India's history that can never be replaced. And we want to point out, too, importantly, that threats to India's cultural heritage are also often threats to natural heritage. Besides um, uncontrolled expansion, uh, of cities, of roads, of quarrying, especially illegal quarrying. Mining is another um, massive impact on archaeological sites in this area. The Sundur Hills uh, near the Humpy Vijayanagar region contain uh, very rich iron and manganese um, ores. And you can see uh, this Google Earth image of this large scale uh, open mining in the Sundur Hills which has some significant consequences for local people, too, in terms of um, erosion, of dust and pollution. Some of the small villages uh, just downstream from the Sondor Hills, actually, the entire village is red. Even the dogs are red, from stained from the dust 
from the ore. Um, loss of forests and wildlife, siltation of reservoirs, and also there's a lot of crime and corruption. Anyone who has any uh, familiarity with Bellari District knows this. All right, so um, many of these kinds of problems that we're documenting are problems for cultural heritage, but they're also problems for natural heritage and for human livelihood and health too. So from, our, so from our perspective then, the task at hand is not merely the regulation of a legal market or the dismantling of an illegal one, but really the governance of context, as we've defined it, in a larger sense. So in the scope of this task, of course, is enormous. And the difficulties of co of, uh, in terms of cost and ad administration are daunting, right? It involves legal frameworks that define rights of access and tenure, the coordination of jurisdictions from the level of village to the center, and of course, most important perhaps, the negotiation of a cultural terrain with intersecting regimes of value, as we just heard so eloquently uh, expressed in the previous paper. So in our own experience working with agencies, with stakeholders and researchers, both in India and in the Americas, we would just note um, two particularly important domains of governance, again, that we've heard before. The first is education, right? Education as a product, project in cultural consciousness and enforcement as a project in stewardship. Education, of course, uh, takes many forms, both formal and informal. And we would point, for example, to the work of Shanti Papu and the Sharma Center for Heritage Education near Chennai as exemplary of a program that reaches both adults and children and that's not limited only to the urban elite. Similarly, protection and enforcement cannot rely solely on the public sector. Right? but require citizen support, as we also heard this morning. Right? In the US, we've worked with a program of site stewards who are unofficial guardians of specific archaeological sites. These are not trained uh, specialists by any means, usually people who live near archaeological sites and take a special interest in them. In our own study area, we've come to view the archaeologically trained villagers of Karibakale, the site we're excavating where I showed you the Iron Age house, as the most important stewards of, the, of this uh, critical archaeological site and of the larger landscape around the village. Here, both education and, I would say, trust come together to constitute a new moral economy of care. So the task of protecting India's cultural heritage is certainly daunting. And we, we have no illusions, I think, about the massive scale of this endeavor. But this is a task inseparable, we would argue, from the need both to protect and preserve context and to attend to the multiple regimes of value within which the material culture participates. Fiscal resources are always limited, right? And the imperative for, imperative for capacity building in education, conservation, and protection is very great. But we would point, I was like to end on a somewhat optimistic note that beyond its rich cultural heritage, India, of course, has another great resource, and that is its people, right? And this certainly, I think, is where we need to begin. <laughs>